Assalamu alaikum. We will begin the program with the recitation of Holy Quran. I will request Maryam Usmani to please come on the stage and recite the Holy Quran. Maryam Usmani. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم Thank you, Mariam Usmani. Now I will request the President of Legal Alumni Association, Washington, D.C., and Mr. Aslam Azar to please come on the stage and welcome the guest. <clears throat> Thank you, Afzal Bhai. Uh, on behalf of Aligarh Alumni Association, uh, I would like to welcome the audience and our guest speaker, Professor Yasmin Saikia. I would also like to welcome Professor Muhammad Ashraf from AMU, who is currently joining from Turkey. Normally, every year we celebrate Sarsier Day Memorial Lecture as well as Sarsier Day Dinner together. But this year, due to some prevailing circumstances, we decided to organize only the annual memo memorial lecture. It's worth mentioning that the scholarship program of the association uh, remains and continues to be the most important program. It is the flagship program of the association. And this year, we gave scholarships to over 350 AMU students. Talking about our other annual events, uh, we have been celebrating International Sarsayya de Mushaira, which we are going to have it this coming Saturday, November 18. Earlier this year, we already celebrated our popular annual Aligarh alumni picnic, as well as Eid Milan function. And those two events gave us the opportunity to strengthen the bond with the community. Also, earlier this year on the eve of India-Pakistan Independence Day, we successfully organized Yome Azadi, Kavi Sammelan, and Mushaira. In the end, I would like to thank the honorable guest, Professor Yasmin Saikia, to accept our invitation to deliver the Sarsaya Day Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aslam Bhai. Uh, first of all, let me say that we have, this program is in the, we, are, we are supposed to do two things. One is the Sasseed Memorial Lecture and other thing association has also decided to honor Professor Muhammad Ashraf, who was the chairman of Department of Mathematics, uh, under whose leadership uh, Department of Mathematics uh, reached uh, at the highest level in India. And right now he's, uh, he's in Turkey attending a conference and right, I was just talking to him and he's having some glitch to join. So what we will do, we'll just shift the gear of the program so we will begin uh, the memorial lecture first, and then we'll follow uh, by the honoring uh, Professor Muhammad Ashraf, because I'll work in the meantime, basically to join him. So before taking further time, I will request uh, one of our new member, uh, Dr. Arina Khan, who is also adjunct faculty of, uh, of George Washington University. She has also served as the faculty member of a legal Muslim university in the past. So she is joining from Washington DC, and she will introduce our keynote speaker, Yashmin Saikia. Uh, Dr. Arina Khan, please. Thank you, Mr. Afzal Usmani. Um, good afternoon, all of you. Um, as uh, mentioned, my name is Arina Khan, and uh, today we have our uh, guest uh, keynote speaker, Professor Yasmin Saikia, and I would briefly introduce her um, before welcoming her to uh, proceed with this lecture. Professor Yasmin Saikia is a professor of history 
and is the first holder of the Distinguished Hart Nikahosh Endowed Chair in Peace Studies at Arizona State University. She is the co-director of the Center of Muslim Experience in the U.S., established at Arizona State University in 2022. Professor Saikia has authored several monographs, edited volumes, and numerous peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. Her book, Fragmented Memories, Struggling to be Thai at Home in India, won the Srikant Dutta Best Book Prize in the Social Sciences and Northeast India from the Nehru Memorial in Delhi, India in 2005. Her another book, Women, War and the Making of Bangladesh, Remembering 1971, won the Oral History Association Biennial Award in 2013. She is a recipient of multiple international fellowships and grants, including the prestigious National Endowment for the Humanities Collaborative Research Grant, Fulbright Fellowship, Harry Frank Guggenheim Fellowship, and multi-year senior fellowships from the American Institutes of Indian Bangladesh as well as Pakistan Studies. She is the editor-in-chief for Cambridge University's press new series, Muslim South Asia and serves on several editorial boards and is the vice president of the South Asian Muslim Studies Association in the United States. She also has held academic appointments at Carleton College, Minnesota from 1997 to 1999, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from 1999 to 2010, and visiting positions at the Center for Civilizational Dialogue at the University of Malaysia in 2011, and Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at American University in Cairo in 2006. In 2023, 2023 Yasmin Saikia was recognized as one of the 100 inspiring Indian Muslim women in the United States by the RBTC Global Leadership Team. With this brief intro, I would like to invite Professor Yasmin Saikia to please come on stage and deliver the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Absal, can you give me the share screen option um, so that I can use it during the lecture? You have the you have the option. All okay, you thank you, Javed. Okay. I first want to thank everybody for this immense honor to present the Sir Sayed Memorial Lecture for 2023. I'm also very humbled and excited to be able to do so. Uh, thank you, Abzal Bai, the organizers of Aligarh Alumni Association of DC for organizing this event and all of those who are attending this lecture from different parts of the world today. Thank you. Sir Sayed's parting words, to the students of Mohammedan Anglo Oriental College, MAO, later known as Aligarh Muslim University, AMU, resonates with a timeless message. I have built this institution for you, he says, and I'm sure you'll carry the light far and wide until darkness disappears from all around. AMU is not confined to a specific place. It is a gift to humanity for self-improvement. Our task as alumni of AMU is to be good custodians of this gift and carry forward the mission to improve the human community with knowledge. Sir Sayed's confidence that the students of AMU can do the task makes it easier for us. He assures us, I'm sure you'll carry the light. In my presentation today, I would like to focus on the responsibility of carrying forward the light of Sir Sayed's mission and share with you the work we are doing at Arizona State University on documenting the Muslim experience in the United States for an improved future. But first, a quick word on the theory of gift of Sir Sayed, because that is worth paying attention to for developing a vision of Muslim empowerment. In the Western Academy, no one knows about Sir Sayed's theory of gift as a, as a relational gesture. Marcel Mauss, a French anthropologist, is considered the pioneer of the theory of gift as a relation building gesture for reciprocal exchange. When we compare Sir Sayed's gift theory with Mauss, we can see some similarities and differences. 
Moss, who studied archaic societies in his book, The Gift, published in 1925, showed that gifting is a way of developing social relationships within the community that is not an economic venture, but is an exchange for strengthening relationships between giver and receiver within the close community. Sir Sayed's theory of the logic of gift making differs from this approach in many significant ways. And mind you, Sir Sayed's gift started much before Moss's book, The 1925 of, of 1925. In Sir Sayed's approach, a gift is a vehicle for human improvement. It is not for transaction or a change. His emphasis on giving far and wide urges AMU alumni to include new recipients so the community of givers and receivers can grow infinitely. In this sense, his theory of gift is a pathway to create a new horizon for inclusive humanity. When we ponder Sir Sayed's approach of gifting as a pathway for human well-being, we become aware that it is predicated on an exception, on an expectation of responsibility to others. As AMU alumni, we have the task of improving the human community by fostering connections between people, promoting cooperation and goodwill, and embracing diversity, overcoming the limitations of binary separations of us and them, good and evil, terms that are very commonly used these days to divide people, even by the President of the United States. Each alig, on the other hand, can engage in the endeavor of contributing to human improvement and thereby inject hope in the world and connect to the original gift of Sir Sayed reaffirming the commitment to remove darkness from all around. The possibility of building this awareness and its potential is boundless. In the US, AMU Alumni Association, like the Alligator Alumni Association today, AAA, that is hosting this event has a long history. The AAA was established in 1975 by Alix, men and women, Abdullah Bhai is here, was one of the original founders, who wanted to carry the light of AMU to the United States. AAA and the other 16 other alumni organizations in the US demonstrate unparalleled dedication. They celebrate AMU spirit through various activities, sustaining the promise to work for human improvement, as we have just heard today from the president, through many cultural, social, and educational events that reach various communities and even benefit the students of AMU through scholarships and mentoring. Run by volunteers, the members of these associations keep alive the spirit of AMU and the love for Sir Sayed through the selfless work. I don't know of any other alumni group in the world that is so dedicated and does what AMU alumni do for their alma mater. I salute my AMU family for this exceptional commitment. On my part, I have committed my contribution to AMU by creating knowledge about Muslim experiences in India and the United States. Pursuing Sir Sayed's invitation to create knowledge for improving the understanding of Muslims, I embarked on the task by first authoring a book on Sir Sayed contributing to Cambridge University Press's recognition of Sir Sayed alongside Gandhi and Nehru. Following this, in partnership with my husband and colleague, Professor Chad Haynes, we approached the university to create an institutional presence for studying the Muslim experience in the United States. The need to create new knowledge about Muslims became urgent with the rising tide of Islamophobia penetrating the psyche of Americans and creating extreme fear and hatred of Muslims as violent extremists. For us, the irrational fear of an antagonism towards Muslims and Islam became evident at ASU's Tempe campus when a random person in September 2021 entered the multi-purpose students' room in the library and desecrated the Quran. He dis we discussed this and other incidents targeting Muslims on campus, and with the support of the Dean of Humanities, we developed the idea of establishing the Center of Muslim Experience in the United States. There's another point of origin of this center, which connects directly to Sir Sayyid. In establishing this center, we reflected on the historical moment of 1857, which was a turning point for Sir Sayyid. The crushing weight of subjecthood under English East India Company had made Indians restive. They watched how a commercial company became a de facto ruler of India 
and was assertively taking control of the economic and political power. To stop the complete loss of India, Indians, Muslims, and Hindus rose up in revolt in 1857. For the British, however, the last standing enemy was a mighty Mughal dynasty, whom the Indian people deemed their leader. The outbreak of the revolt became a pretext for the British to get rid of their enemy, the Mughals, which they did. After killing each and every heir of the Mughal dynasty and exiling them out of India, the British became the colonial rulers of India and the people were transformed into colonial subjects of the English crown. Muslims were maligned and punished severely for leading the revolt. This sudden transformation of the Muslim condition from rulers to hated subjects weighed heavy on Indian Muslim minds, but their fear and anxiety crippled them from moving forward. Sir Sayyid too suffered incredible personal losses in 1857. Most painful for him was the loss of his mother who died of starvation because she could not access human food during the 12 days of siege of Delhi in 1857 and had to eat horse fodder. A lesser man would have crumbled in these circumstances of loss. But Sir Sayyid approached the situation differently. He understood that British colonialism was real and here to stay. But instead of violently resisting the rule, he offered an unthought solution of Muslim empowerment. He adopted a moderate, inclusive voice of reform, focusing on education of Muslim identity formation, and carried out his project under the watchful eyes of the British masters. His target in the beginning was upper-class Muslim gentry, who he believed, once empowered, could be the beacon for changing the condition of Muslims in the Indian subcontinent. With this intent in mind, and against all odds and great hardships, including massive opposition from the Muslim ulema, Sir Sayyid established the Anglo -Orient, Anglo, Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College in 1875, modeled after Oxbridge and Cambridge universities. At MAO, education was imparted in the English language because Sir Sayyid understood that only with purposeful modern education, Muslims could once again become a relevant and contributing community and empower themselves and others in the country. Sir Sayyid's MAO blossomed into AMU in 1920 and became the dynamic site for an emergent and confident Muslim voice. What an achievement. Being a historian, I revisited and studied the revolt of 1857, the Muslim condition and Sir Sayyid's response very carefully and realized that then, as well as now, Muslims are scapegoated for all ills and violence. I also realized that we cannot let others write the narrative about us. We must be the authors of our own narratives to claim our place and voice as Muslims. As inheritors of Sir Sayyid's legacy, I saw this as an opportunity to do our part in empowering Muslims. Thus, the Center of Muslim Experience in the US was born in September, 2022. I want to pull up my slides. Um, sorry, uh, it's always a challenge with okay. So it was we are provost approved university wide center. It is led by two directors. We have an interdisciplinary faculty from various fields, including computer science, math, sustainability, religious studies, journalism, urban studies, and so on. At ASU, we have 5,000, okay. we have 5,000 Muslim students, as you can see, which is perhaps the largest in the country. So they can play a very significant role in contributing to Muslim empowerment for this generation and for the future. The center is working very actively with Muslim students on campus. We have a lot, we have a support staff to run the center. We have a program officer who is a recent graduate from Harvard University with an MA in Islamic studies. We have a general accounts and um, manager for, that we share with the larger school. And we have a development officer from the university. Now the purpose, so this is a structure of this center. The purpose of the center is to tell the story of Muslim Americans and raise awareness that Muslim Americans are like any other group of Americans. 
They are accomplished people contributing to local and national communities, culture, society, and economy, and they deserve respect as human persons. To drive home the point that Muslim Americans are like any other group in the United States, we call ourselves See Me Us, that is the acronym, calling upon other Americans to see Muslims as one of us, and that the us can be strengthened when it is inclusive of Muslims and other marginal groups. See Me Us has a singular vision. Our vision is to transform the narrative about Muslims and strengthen Muslim belonging in the United States. We hope with the support of various units and people within and outside ASU, we'll be able to build and sustain a very successful center that can become the node for thinking and representing Muslim experiences and accomplishments nationally and globally and reach this world to the wider, and reach this knowledge to the wider world. In one year of existence, we have accomplished quite a lot. Pursuing our interest in understanding the Muslim minority condition, in September 2023, we organized an international workshop on Muslims in Western and Asian democracies and constituted a global network of scholars who will be working together on this topic for the next three years to produce academic publications, policy reports, and articles. As you can see, this was the, the group that we brought together from Germany, from Spain, from Italy, Austria, United States, and the UK. Um, so this is the, uh, out, the project that we are doing right now, the research project. We have a, for student success, we are doing quite a lot of work. These two students, um, um, Simra Mahin and Umera Ali. Umera is actually a daughter of an Aligarh alum. They are doing oral history in um, the local area to document Muslim contributions to culture and economy. There are three other students who have volunteered. These two are scholarship holders at the center. We have three other volunteers who are doing different work of developing a database of different Muslim organizations and uh, doing also oral history research and also working with us to develop a study of media representation of Muslims. We have also at the center, we have adopted in a way two Afghan refugee scholars, a father and son team, Dr. Asifi and Najim Asifi, who are doing different kinds of work. One, he is an artist who is doing a lot of artwork on Muslim life in the US. And Najim is doing oral history research with Afghan refugees to understand the problems and seek solution to refugee condition, Phoenix being one of the largest refugee receiving cities in the country. We are also doing a lot of outreach uh, to the wider community, one of them being the installation of the crescent moon on Tempe's A Mountain to celebrate Ramadan in 2023 and create a Muslim presence in Arizona's public life. This is going to be an annual event where annually we'll put up the Ramadan lights um, in order to naturalize the presence of Muslims in Arizona. During the National Football League final game this year in February 2023, we organized a discussion between retired NFL players Hamza Abdullah and Matt Ware on the, on the topic of faith and football. The other more exciting thing for me that I am working on, and this is something really interesting um, that you may be, that you would, I hope, would be excited to hear, is this research on Muslims in Phoenix. Now, as you can see, this person here on the right, his name is Mubarak Ali Khan, who came to the United States in 1923 and moved to Arizona in 1937. He originally comes from Uttar Pradesh. We do not know how he arrived in the US, but this is where he settled. This is his, um, in his great stone and he is buried in Phoenix. He died in 1963. From 1937 to 1946, Mubarak Ali Khan worked relentlessly for the naturalization of Muslims in the US, uh, not just Muslims, sorry, South Asians. 
South Asians, like other Asians, were excluded from gaining naturalized um, status as citizen by an Exclusion Act of 1924. And Mubarak Ali, with some of other you know, supporters under the Indian Welfare Association, as it was called, worked in order to repeal this Exclusion Act that was repealed in 1946 by President Truman, and a new act called the Loose Seller Act was passed, allowing South Asians to become naturalized citizens of the United States. You and I are actually the beneficiaries of this uh, work of Mubarak Ali Khan. Unfortunately, Mubarak Ali Khan is not known in any history books, nor has his name been entered anywhere by South Asians who work on this issue of the presence of South Asians in America. So this work is allowing us to shed light on a Muslim who had done incredible work for all South Asians and other Asians in the country, but who is very little recognized. He is buried in Phoenix, as I said, along with 26 other very early pioneers from South Asia who had settled here. They were mostly uh, farmers, uh, of different kinds, agricultural people. They were from mostly now today the area of Pakistan and India, UP and Punjab. And as you can see, there, there are a couple of great stones here that I have put out of two women. One is Paulita Khan and one is Helen Khan, who were wives of two different men who had settled here. I'm doing oral history with the progeny of these families to document what the early lives of Muslims were like in Arizona and what the contributions of these people were. It's very exciting to be doing this work. So moving forward, we have other plans for the next two, two, uh, two to three years, which we call phases two and three. In the first part of phase two, we are documenting uh, and researching uh, five cities in the United States, one of them being New York, where we are focusing on the cultural diversity of Muslims. We are looking at Chicago's civic engagement in San Jose and the greater Bay Area. We're looking at technology and entrepreneurship. In Dallas, we are looking at Muslim spiritual awakening. And in Phoenix, we are looking at people's histories because we have this very early history of Muslims here, along with the histories of refugees. That seems to be a current condition of a problem of citizenship and recognition. So alongside these projects, we will also be developing a Muslim LinkedIn network for connecting academics, professionals, and media personnel to share and strengthen the image of Muslim communities nationally and globally. We are starting this work by focusing first on media. With a current grant from the American Council of Learned Societies, we are connecting students at ASU, AMU, and Soderton's University of Applied Sciences in Sweden to participate in an intensive media literacy program, equipping them with skills necessary to create a Muslim, experience, Muslim youth experiences media toolkit. Also, we are developing a proposal for increasing youth leadership in the professional arena. For this, we are working with a Chicago-based company owned and run by Muslim entrepreneurs to build an app that will be available to all Muslim students across the nation and globally to develop leadership, leadership skills and improve personal well-being. On behalf of ACME USA, I would like to invite you to be involved in this project by helping us to find volunteers or volunteering yourself in the city's research project, providing contact information to build the Muslim LinkedIn network, linking us with emerging leaders who can mentor students and are spreading the word of what we are doing. With your partnership and collaboration, we can host community events that will place Muslims as advocates of their own story and show how they are changing the United States in positive ways. Also, this endeavor can serve as a model for Muslim communities outside the US to become advocates for improving the image of Muslims and empowering themselves so that never again false narrative of Muslims are created and given prominence in the public realm. Muslims must take this leadership role because no one else will do the task for us. Advocating for ourselves and laying the groundwork in the United States so that the Muslims globally can learn from our experience and speak for themselves with knowledge and compassion is the right thing to do as our religion teaches us to speak up against injustice and acknowledge dignity that is due to all human persons. We invite you to become the people who can inspire. By inspire, I want to 
I want to show you this. This is a map that I found that child, uh, young kids had done during 9-11. There is a map here of post pre-9-11 and post-9-11. You can see there's a huge shift between from being happy to being fearful, hopeful to hysterical, fit, feeling that you are in, feeling that you are out, um, all kinds. So we have come up with another thing called Inspire. So we want you if and us, all of us, to contribute together to this map that we illuminate the Muslim condition as well as we can, wherever we can. We support one another by creating networks. We share what we have, information and other knowledge. We promote each other and ourselves in the work that we do so that others cannot tell these narratives about us and we do it ourselves. We try to influence people who are our allies to see Muslims as part of us and we do the research and educate people so that we dignify the Muslim community. This is the work that we are doing. And this is what you would see. We are the two people who are running the center. My husband, Chad Haynes, who is a professor of religious studies and anthropology. And I am the, a historian and hold the peace study chair. So this is the work we are doing in order to do our part in upholding what Sir Sayed had asked us to do, to spread knowledge and remove the darkness from all around. Thank you very much for listening to me and thank you for this opportunity once again to everybody. And I hope we can continue to have a good discussion in the Q&A. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted and talking. <laughs> So thank you, Yasmin Appa, for a wonderful talk and uh, explaining about this, uh, your center in ASU, what it is doing. So we have a question answer session, but before we start the question answer session, let me put the first question being as a host. Uh, so my, my simple question is that as uh, maybe I, it will not be a bragging about the association, but it's established fact that Illegal Alumni Association, Washington, D.C., which is one of the oldest MU alumni association outside of Indian subcontinent, established in 1975 in the DMV area. And uh, they have been doing the charitable and cultural and community events since 1975. So we are the oldest association doing an organized Mushara, even though a lot of people will comment about Mushara, but uh, trust me, I have analyzed a lot. I've been, I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, California, Austin, Texas. Mushara played a key role to strengthen the alumni group across US. And that led to the establishment of the Federation of Illegal Alumni Association in, you know, at least in the United States. And we have now more than 15 uh, member alumni associations across US. So the Illegal Alumni Association Washington DC has been doing this cultural and community work as uh, our president Aslam Azad mentioned that we have a flagship program of a scholarship, which was a, a unique model of scholarship. We have endowed a scholarship concept that means a donor donates money and we endow that money and the revenue of that money is distributed. So principle is intact. And as a statistical data, so far in last more than 35 years, we raised only $1.1 million, but we distributed more than a million dollar and Alhamdulillah, we have more than $2 million in our endowment. So this is a great model we have been working on and the, our, our founders and the, the carriers of the association, they have established this uh, thing. So my question to you, as I said, I'm not bragging about the association. I'm the third generation of the in the association, but I, I, I definitely felt that we should talk about that. So my simple question to you that how the Illegal Alumni Association Washington DC can play a role in your center to basically carry forward the message that, hey, this is what we have been doing and how we can help and collaborate and cooperate. Thank you. Absol, thank you so much for the question and for actually offering help to our center by saying, how can we help? In a way, you're opening the door for this conversation. Um, and as I said in my um, presentation, I recognize the immense work that AA has been doing, um, not just in DC, but nationally. And I know you have been organizing these lectures that you invite a variety of people, um, mostly academics, to really shed light on Sir Sayyid and keeping this kind of conversation going that knowledge and community come together in um, producing um, you know, new opportunities and possibilities. 
And I'm really glad to hear that you have $2 million in endowment, which is a large sum of money for a volunteer group to raise. Um, as I said, and I requested in my presentation, we are trying to develop a Muslim LinkedIn network uh, that will connect all kinds of professionals with students, not just at ASU, but any student who might want to access it. We would really appreciate any kind of information you can share with us of people who can be good um, mentors for students, young students who want to have leadership role. Um, this, we came up with this idea because um, we had several students actually who came up to us and said, particularly in the STEM fields, that, uh, and if you are wearing a hijab, you are an absolute outsider. There are There is no faculty member at ASU. ASU is the largest university in the country, and we do not have a single Muslim woman faculty member in the STEM field. So they have no mentors. The young students finishing their degree in physics or in biomedical engineering and environmental sciences, as you know, ASU is well known for some of these fields. Uh, do not have any mentors. So creating this online mentorship LinkedIn group for Muslims as both as professional and as upcoming and emerging um, professionals would be very helpful. Anything that AA can help us on that would be great. We would also like to think about the app. We have been talking to, um, uh, he's not an Aligarian, he's from Madras originally, Muslim owned business in Chicago to develop an app for which we need to do a lot of survey for how to develop Muslim uh, students' leadership in the future. If you can help us with that, whether it is financially or um, with more ideas, we'd very much appreciate it. There are other ways in which you can create a section for AMU within CME US, and I would really like to talk about it. That is one of my dreams, that there would be a place for Sir Sayed um, here at ASU and make it something more permanent. Um, as you can see, I hold a chair in peace studies because someone thought about it and endowed the chair and she was a retired professor. So there are different ways of leveraging um, in this university and figuring it out uh, if we can create a chair for Sir Sayed um, um, for a study of Muslims globally. It doesn't have to be confined to just India. It can be a global thing, but in the name of Sir Sayed, that would be something enormous. I don't think any university has created a chair for, in the name of Sir Sayed. Thank you, Yasmin Appa. And uh, I will request all the participants. And if you have any question, I see Razibai raised a hand. I will definitely give a chance to him. So just announcement that anyone who has a question, either you can put in the chat or just raise your hand will give you a chance. We have a, a, a 10 minutes of question, 15 minutes, but already five minutes is gone. So Razibai, please turn on your mic and ask the question. Ji, Yasmin Sahaba, Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam. Ji, kal aapko miss kiya, kal aap, you were supposed to. I could not do it my sister's birthday. Ji, maalum hai. So you just mentioned about Mubarak Ali Khan, and fortunately, uh, in the prestigious magazine, Economic and Political Weekly. Yes. Yeah. In 2019, there is an article written by Anup Kumar on the life and legacy of Mubarak Ali Khan. And this is like the, his campaign uh, to rescind the laws to let the immigrants come was quite mentioned in this. So 1917, ki baat hai, hai, so I think and with the heavy presence of students and all the Muslim presence. I think it is a time that to recognize Mubarak Ali Khan, uh, we Aligarians and the Muslim, Indian Muslims should uh, propose for a scholarship in his memory at, at uh, Arizona State University. Uh, Mubarak Ali Khan Memorial or even Mubarak Ali Khan Memorial Sir Sayyid Chair, whatever. But Mubarak Ali Khan should be put on the Arizona space by the Muslims of in Indian subcontinent at this time. And if I, I will send you the uh, link to that article. No, and, I have it. Thank you okay. very much. All right. In, in fact, uh, Razab, thank you so much for this very enthusiastic um, interest in Mubarak Ali Khan. I came across Mubarak Ali Khan in reading a book um, 
that came out just last year, 2022, in which it's kind of like just two little lines were written towards the end of the book. It was a book with two of 275 pages. Five not pages and it was, I think, in page 262 or something, like toward the end of the book, just a little mention that uh, when uh, Senator Langor of North Dakota came to uh, Arizona, this man called Mubarak Ali Khan raised noise that uh, South Asians are not included as citizens. And then the book goes on to talk about Jagjit Singh and other kinds of figures, South Asians who had played a role. Now, in doing the research, I came across that particular article, which talks of in you know, a different issues of Mubarak Ali Khan in a very um, good way. I contacted the, he's a journalist, so he did not do a very deep study. Um, I then started looking online and found from the historical society in Arizona that there is a box of papers on Mubarak Ali Khan um, that was deposited in the Western um, Arizona, Western Valley Bank, which is no, which is defunct now. That's where I found a picture of Mubarak Ali Khan. A lot of his personal letters uh, about taking loans and all kinds of stuff, letters from his wife, visits with um, to Pakistan to develop a relationship between U.S. and Pakistan trade. Trying to, as you said, the scholarship is very appropriate, a chair of scholarship, because Mubarak Ali Khan tried to create a scholarship for international Muslim students to come to Arizona and to have education here. He and two other people were involved in this. And they tried to do this around 1951 or something. And it didn't go through, of course, we, don't, we didn't see it. So there's a lot of Mubarak Ali Khan. Was by chance in uh, uh, doing internet search, I came across the section of the Islam Muslim Cemetery in Phoenix, went there, those pictures come from, you know, pictures that we had taken. And there are 26 people buried there. Nobody knows about it. So I so much um, appreciate this, the enthusiasm and the interest to do something for Mubarak Ali Khan and recognize him as a pioneer who empowered not just Muslims, but South Asians on the whole in the United States. Uh, I think we need to tell these stories because, as I said, nobody else would. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yasmin Appa. Uh, I see a question from Dr. Rafat Hussain on the chat box. So Rafat Bhai, please... Uh... If you can speak up so that other can hear and uh, Yasmin Appa can address that. Okay, thank you. I thought you will read my comment, but anyway. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Sekia. It was a wonderful lecture. So my question is, ours is a very, one of the oldest association, or I would say the oldest association in the United States. And uh, it is time, or we should assess our functioning time to time. So what my question is what else we should do uh, to support the muslims and in particular the ANU? what else is missing in our function because uh, because uh, uh, afzal has already um, elaborated what what are we doing right now no, thank you so much, Rafat Bhai, for this uh, very important question. And also, Abzal had raised this thing, what, how can we partner do things together? One thing I have found um, that people don't know about AMU, you know, just across the board. Some Muslims are aware, some Arab Muslims are aware of AMU, people who, you know, study something on Islamic uh, studies or history, they're aware. But generally speaking, Non in non subcontinental Muslims are not very aware of AMU and Sir Sayyid. We need to make this more and more prominent. And as I said, doing that, offering that book on Sir Sayyid, which was a Cambridge um, companion reader. Cambridge companion readers have been come. Uh, they have been publishing these read companions for the last one hundred years. And from India, there were only two books, one on Gandhi and one on Nehru. So bringing Sir Sayyid into that discussion and putting out a book on Sir Sayyid, I think was a major contribution for people outside to read, particularly in non-Muslims to read about Sir Sayyid. So we, we have to do more that pull Sir Sayyid um, out of the AMU probably are, are like we, we kind of possess him and we kind of think he's our man, and we are very sentimental about Sir Sayyid and emotional. And, but I think we have learned to share him. 
and we have to learn to share with a wider audience. But what the associations can do about AMU is, I know that there are very few people who are engaged in social science and humanities um, fields in the US who are from AMU, but doing direct seminars maybe in different universities on this topic would be also very helpful. That goes outside of the AMU community and beyond. And we have to make partners with many other um, academics elsewhere. But I would still think because ASU, I am sitting here and I'm doing this work and I'm you know, committed to this work, if we can do something here and then project it nationally so that every maybe not every year, but every other year or something, a national convention on Sir Sayed and AMU can be held at ASU. That would probably bring a variety of scholars and would also produce new material, new scholarship, new articles, publications um, that would help a lot. So we can focus on CME US, make all our um, you know, connections there and build that up and make this a center where every other year we have a conference on Sir Sayyid or AMU on Muslim ex expanded. Like I'll give you the example of the similar thing had uh, happened at um, Madison, Wisconsin, where I studied. In 1968, some professors got together and decided that they were going to do a South Asia conference there. When I was a student, that was a small conference. We would have like maybe 20, 30 people show up in the late 90s and around 100 students or something coming to this conference. Now it is 800 people who presented this conference after 25 years. It started in 68 and has been going on. It was the 51st year this year. Um, no, so it's the 70 something. So it was the 51st year this year that we had this conference and it's growing humongously exponentially. So it takes time to build, but it's always at Madison. It was done by Madison professors. It remained and everybody congregates there every year. So we can think something like that in that model, if that helps you to think how the association, AMU and American academia can come together to create a visibility for Sir Sayed and AMU education here in the United States. Thank you so much. And I think that the association will take note of your suggestions and thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Yasmin Appa, and thank you, Rafat Bhai, for the for nice and wonderful question. If you have any other question, feel free to raise your hand. I see a raise, uh, I'm, uh, Dr. Sayed Amir raise your hand. Amir Bhai, please uh, go ahead and ask the question. Thank you, Professor. Very impressive. Um, my links to Aligarh Muslim University go way back into the 50s, late 50s. Um, my question to you, your organization, by the way, is doing excellent work. And I admire that. Uh, what I find missing is the, uh, that has been emphasized by the recent events going on, that the bonds of Muslims in this country has not weakened, which seems to be one of the aims of your organization. What is non-existent is the participation and the influence of the Muslim community, not only South Asia in general, is virtually nil in this country politics and direction of this what the way it, this country is going uh give me let me give you an example at this moment there are two prominent south asians non-muslims who are in the forefront uh, of the nomination for the republican party i cannot visualize that a muslim indian or any muslim would be in that position during my lifetime or beyond and um, so what i'm looking for your organization trying to push Muslim community, uh, not so much of the religious affiliation, but already bond is very strong, into a um, political uh, field and be involved and make an impact on the politics and direction of this, how this country is going. Thank you. Um, Sir Amir Saab, very thank you so much for your question, not just a question, also a suggestion and instilling a sense of a, um, community advocacy and, and, and involvement much deeper than what Muslims are doing. Um, in doing, in starting the center, first of all, let me tell you, the center is not so heavily endowed. Um, it is 
Whereas all the other centers, my other center in which I have my chair is very well endowed. It's 20 year old center. We have ton of money from the president. This is a, pro is a center that has been approved, but our money is extremely limited. So we are doing a lot of, um, we are depending a great deal on donors. We have been very, very fortunate to have a few very committed donors who have given us um, a substantial amount of start startup money for the next two to three years. And because of that, we are able to do the work we are doing, whether it's international conference, giving scholarship to students, supporting humanitarian work of refugee scholars, or planning all this LinkedIn and, um, and, and the five city um, research project. But what you're saying is all of this knowledge and what we know ourselves um, has to be made more prominent in different ways and particularly with political advocacy. Even running a small center, I'm finding that money is critical. Um, and the more money you have, the more work you can do because you can hire more people to do the work and you can accelerate and proliferate this knowledge. Since we don't have it, we are doing it in, in the ways we can. For political advocacy, likewise, you need a lot. It's not like we do not organize discussions on these issues. We are doing like just on the 9th, um, we did a discussion on um, mutual understanding for Palestine and Israel, where my husband spoke and with other Jewish um, faculty members. And it went extremely well that now there'll be more of this. But we are doing the work only as academics. In order to have people out in the political realm, as you are saying, um, you know, I think places like DC and New York and maybe LA are the main places. What are they doing there? Um, we were recently in California for another Sarsayed Day actually event that Shahir Bhai had organized. Um, it's, it's amazing that with all the money, very little work is being done. Um, so, I am not a political scientist, nor do I do political advocacy work, but I write a lot in order to educate people that Indian Muslims are part and parcel of America now, or any Muslim group is part and parcel, and they can be a very important factor in the future. Right now, the Muslim population in America, according to Pew Research Center, is no more than four to five million people, which is just 1.3% of the population. Now, what is the role of 1.3% in creating political influence is something Muslims must sit together and talk because it's not a very small group, but they're dispersed and how to concentrate. So I'm not a political scientist to be able to do that kind of work, but I'm very keen if there are some people, like particularly if we can do a chair on Muslim studies in the name of Sir Sayed and Mubarak Ali scholarship, Probably that is the area we should look at, how to create. I know that ISPU um, is doing work in DC, but they are trying to influence policy matters and not directly come into politics in order to have, as you're saying, influence in uh, the future presidential election and others. I'm sorry, means uh, as an academic, that is my reach and that's what I can say. That's, there are people who fine. are much better than Thank me you. who can, who can give you a much um, you. convincing answer. Thank you. Whatever you're doing is very admirable work. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin Appa. And uh, due to the time shortage, I will just take one more question. Uh, and I see Masood Farshuri Bhai has raised his hand. So Masood Bhai, this will be the last question. And if, and any other participant or panelists, if they have any question, please write, write it on the chat box. We'll share it with Yasmin Appa and maybe we can uh, have an email exchange and all that. So Masood Bhai, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Afzal. And uh... Thank you very much, Ms. Dr. Yasmin, for your presentation and enlightening us today. I have actually two questions, so depending on the time, you can answer either one of them. First one, you already touched base on you, and my thought and question was that uh, in this doing all, we are aging, especially people from the AMU background, and our children are not from AMU. They have been a study and raised here. So I, have you thought about or have any suggestion how to bring them into this fold uh, in a mindset or motivate them uh, to the message of Sir Sayyid in modern way? And you touched on that, have some seminars and LinkedIn, uh, which our youngsters are attracted to. 
So that's one. And the second question I have, I just came to my mind, that being a chair of peace and studies, especially the religion and conflict, what message you have for the school going or the youngsters, especially in the universities with this tense environment right now, which all of us know there's a hatred on each side. What message uh, are the part we want to invoke in them when they go out and face the challenges? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masud Sab, for your questions. Um, I, yes, as I said, the youth involving, including I showed you the picture of Omera Ali, who is Arshad Ali's daughter from AMU, my junior, much, uh, he works for Deloitte here. So he has somehow instilled in his daughter the importance of AMU's message and Sir Sayed's work, and so she reached out to us. We, if we have money in future, we may be able to do, a, we have been thinking about it, a youth summer camp um, in which we can have these discussions. Because as your second question that you raised, that there is incredible fear and anxiety in the young people today. And they really do not, and particularly with the Gaza story, um, the horrific violence there is really making people feel like nobody cares about them. And, and we need to really turn that corner because if we keep harp, if we keep thinking about the horrible, horrible things and the way Muslims are treated, um, whatever potential our young people have will be lost. We, we, we cannot really go there. Rather, we have to tell them that you'll be successful. Everybody wants you to be successful. Um, you can do well and only when you do well, you can help the world. So the message has to be different, right? And the message has to be reinforced through the right kind of material. So hence that, as I told you, we are also partnering with AMU and Sweden um, and ASU to create a youth experience toolkit for media. So hopefully once a toolkit gets uh, established, which will be next year, we'll be able to share with everybody. We would like to reach it to as many schools and colleges and universities so that people can access it and can use it and, and be able to add their voice into the toolkit. But your bigger question is how to, um, how to, how to inspire young people in this present climate of uh, Islamophobia, Islamomesia, whatever term you may use. And since everybody is feeling very isolated and alienated, um, creating collective groups and having like, why are, don't we have young people here today in this discussion? Um, you know, I think is something we need to talk about. How can we bring people to a Sir Sayed Memorial Lecture to listen to it, make that topic maybe more attractive, whatever it takes. Can we think of it as this part or as this place from where now we, from next year, we say, we are going to bring 200 young people to listen to this and, and help them sort of see that they can play a part in, in these kind of um, organizational work rather than thinking it only belongs to AMU students who had graduated 50, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so yeah, I work with students all the time and as a peace and conflict chair, as you asked me, and I'll end with that, my approach has always been, and I've been writing, I wrote three books on this, um, basically um, emphasizing the question of people's peace, that people have to, people actually live quite peacefully with one another. We don't emphasize this enough, rather we emphasize the political um, uh, dissonance, the kind of media sound bites that only talk about hatred and violence. And then we let that crowd our mind and penetrate our being and, and start believing that everybody else is also wicked and hateful. So, but on the ground, when I did this work, I found that normal people, even in conflict times, live in peace and want peace. And I think we should express and, and, and spread this message more. And inshallah, the third book is coming out next year and I'd love to send a copy of it so that I can get um, feedback from you all how to expand this idea of people's peace to reach to our younger generation. Thank you. Thank you, Yasminapa. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk and question answer session. And I think, as I said like earlier, because of the short of time, we are concluding this, uh, this part of the program and starting the second part of the program, which was supposed to be the first part, but, and we are glad that Professor Muhammad Ashraf uh, has joined the program. He joined a little bit late, but because of some technical glitch, 
Professor Mohammad Ashraf is joining us from Turkey, right where he's at present attending a conference. Uh, Professor Mohammad Ashraf uh, is a former chairman. Recently, his term ended by end of October as a chairman of the Department of Mathematics, Aligarh Muslim University. He is alumni of Aligarh Muslim University, and uh, I know him for a long time. Uh, when I joined AMU in 1988, he was still living in SS Hall South in room number 50. <laughs> So, and uh, presently, he, then he started his career at AMU. He served in the Middle East also as a, as a professor of mathematics. And recently, he, he was dean faculty of science also. So, uh, as, uh, as you all know, that very recently, earlier this year, there was a news came that uh, Department of Mathematics uh, was ranked as the highest, uh, basically, whatever the academic score. I'm not from the academy, so uh, Professor Ashraf is going to talk about that. So, Department of Mathematics was ranked as the number one in, in, across India. So that's why a legal alumni association, Washington DC decided to honor Professor Muhammad Ashraf and of course the uh, Department of Mathematics for this great achievement. So I will request the president of the association and uh, chairman of board of trustees to, they're already on this stage, on, on Zoom stage. And I will request Prof, uh, Mr. Khoshid Usmani, who is the chairman of the board of trustee to read the plaque. I will share on the screen the plaque so that uh, we, everyone can see that. Let me. So we'll, a physical plaque will be sent to Professor Mohammad Ashraf uh, soon. So hold on, Khushid, can you read that? I'll request uh, Mr. Khushid Usmani to please read the plaque. Sure. Um, the Aligarh Alumni Association Washington DC is proud to honor Professor Mohammad Ashraf for his admirable leadership as chairman of the Department of Mathematics, Aligarh Muslim University, India in raising the department to number one position among mathematics departments of Indian universities. This ranking is published by US News and World Report in 2023. This plaque is presented by Aslam Azad, President, Khurshid Usmani Chairman on November 12, 2023 by Washington, at Washington DC, United States. Thank you, Khurshid Bhai. And after that, uh, without any delay, I will request Professor Mahmoud Ashraf uh, to say a few words, Professor Mahmoud Ashraf. Thank you, Afzal. Thank you very much. So, are you getting me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, first of all, uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank all the office bearers of the uh, Aligarh Alumni Association, Washington, D.C., for honoring our department and uh, giving this honor to uh, me as a uh, former chairperson of the chair, chairperson of the department of mathematics this honor is uh, in fact honor uh, not uh, for me only this is uh, for our whole department for uh, the faculty members uh, and uh, other uh, research scholars of the department so uh, first of all uh, excuse me, somebody is calling me. So first of all, I will uh, just give some idea about how this department came uh, to the forefront of the uh, mathematics department in uh, in the India as well as on the world map. Uh, in fact, uh, our department, it is one of the oldest department of the university. Mm, uh, you all know being uh, Ligarian. And uh, there was a, in, a, a very famous mathematician, Andre Way. He was invited in our department in 1930, and he stayed about uh, two years in the department. And at that time, he established a very good library. And that is backbone of the uh, department. In fact, nowadays, that is the uh, best library in the, in the North India. So uh, we have almost uh, a foundation in the department. Later on, in uh, 2017, 1617, uh, we thought that our department is just like other department in the university, but how to raise the standard of the department. Uh, in fact, we decided that uh, we should uh, at least allow the students to submit PhD thesis uh, with the publication of at least one paper in a CI listed journal. 
So this has a lot of impact on the standard of the uh, department because uh, uh, during last five years, our department has published more than 800 research papers. And all of them are listed in the SCI uh, uh, journals. So this, this plays a very I mean, uh, important role in ranking. And uh, this is really uh, um, I mean, uh, a matter of great pride for us that uh, in 2022, we were ranked uh, 178. And with the help of our uh, publication now, we, we are uh, at the uh, rank of 137 throughout the world. Uh, while TIFR, which has uh, uh, ranked uh, second, uh, it has got 324th, uh, 24th rank in uh, in the world. And uh, it is followed by ISI Calcutta, which has got 342. And uh, later on, IIT Kanpur has got fourth position with the with the ranking of 352 in the, in the world. And IIT Madras has got 372. Uh, and I see Bangalore has got the rank of 384. These are the only six institutions from India that has been ranked. So uh, this shows that, uh, in fact, uh, what restriction we put on the students uh, that paid a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, this can be done in other departments also, being... Uh, Dean of the Faculty of Science, once I, I called the meeting of all chairpersons. And now we have decided that in future, uh, all the departments should have this kind of practice that they should not allow any students to submit his thesis without publishing in SCI journals. So maybe inshallah in future, uh, I am sure that uh, others department will also do better. And uh, as far as our department is concerned, uh, inshallah, we are uh, working towards getting, uh, I mean, uh, below 100 position in the world. So this is all about uh, the departments and its ranking. So I once again thank all of you uh, for being here, for uh, giving me this opportunity to present the uh, I mean, to tell you about the ranking of the department. This I once again thanks for giving this an honor, this honor to the Department of Mathematics, Aligarh Muslim University, Aligarh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammad Ashraf, and I just let everyone know that uh, Dr. Abdullah Sahab is also one of the former faculty member of Department of Mathematics and Start Six, and he was a student of that department too. Is there Abdullah? You raised uh, your hand. You have any question? You're muted. You're muted, Adulabai. Adulabai, you can unmute your own. Okay. Now I'm unmuted. First of all, I mean, congratulations to Ashasab and uh, myself now. and Rashid. There are mm -hmm. two uh, proud graduates of the same department. Yes. And I think, I mean, uh, Muhammad Rashid was also a few years junior to me, but, you know, he he's also graduated. I think some credit goes to Jamil Ahmed Siddiqui also for modernizing the syllabus of the mathematics department. But I think this technique, putting the uh, one publication before mm. you approve the dissertation, did help. And I think all the departments will be helped that way. And also about the previous talk, Abzal, I would suggest that you should have a separate meeting sometimes and invite Yasmin Saikia really to have a more elaborate discussion that what we can do together. Thank you. Well, okay, sure, definitely. So, one minute I want to add. Please, please. So, basically, I have not uh, uh, mentioned the name of so many uh, our, um, uh, like Professor Jamil Siddiqui Saab, Professor Izhar Hussain, and there has been uh, many others also. Yeah. They have done a lot of work, um, especially Professor Siddiqui Sahib, he went uh, in the middle. 
uh, because of, I mean, I don't know why he returned back to Canada. But as far as when he was there, uh, he did a lot what he has done. He, he was a very good analyst. So uh, there are still some some of his students in our uh, university. Thank you, uh, Professor Mohammad Ashraf Sahib, and thank you, Abdullah Bhai, and thank you, Yasmin Appa. I will request uh, our treasurer, Mohammad Javis Sahib, to Yasmin Appa, give us a few more minutes. We just have a last uh, item on the agenda, the official vote of thanks, and Tarana. So without the Tarana, we will not finish the program. So I will request to Mohammad Javis Sahib to please uh, share, uh, sorry, present vote of thanks. Uh, Abdal, Ji. before that, I mean, Yasmin wants to say something, let her finish. Oh, sorry. You want to say something else, Manapa? Yes, I don't. Yes, she you're raised you're her hand. Excuse me. Sorry, Asha Saab, Thank you for presenting. Um, you know this uh, story of the success of the mathematics department at AMU. I'm very excited to hear it, and I am bringing this up because I am running um, a series, a new series called in Cambridge University Press called Muslim South Asia. And we are always looking for good books on Muslims um, in the subcontinent. When Aligarh people have approached me, and unfortunately, I'm not able to take any of the proposals for publication because nobody publishes anything in peer reviewed journals in advance, and they want to publish a book with Cambridge University Press. So what you have suggested that you are asking your PhD students to publish in major journal for mathematics and learn the technique of what it takes. How can we do this for AMU young emerging faculty and PhD students early on so that they become very competitive um, you know, academics in the future? Can you help us with AMU on this? Or uh, nowadays, in fact, uh, the students, those who are working in our department, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, these are around uh, 100 students are uh, in PhD in our department. That is the biggest department in uh, Faculty of Science. But mostly uh, they publish in SCI listed SCI journals. I mean, uh, in uh, journals of uh, various. Uh, especially in uh, uh, the journals which are being published in Cam by Cambridge Press. I know there are some math journals in yes, mathematics, yes, yes. Yeah. but uh, yeah, they have very high impact factor, no doubt. Uh, our uh, students are trying for that. We always uh, tell them that uh, try to publish in uh, journals in of Q1 category or Q2 category or Q3. So, inshallah, in future, they will do that. And as far as the publication of books uh, are concerned, uh, writing a book, uh, basically in mathematics, uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, during past uh, five, six years, you can see there are, uh, our faculty members have published uh, about around a dozen of books, but mostly it, it has uh, been published in Springer and uh, other genres, not there. So it is not easy to publish there, it, no doubt. I know it is difficult, but uh, we will inspire them to just try there also. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin Appa, and thank you, Ashub Bhai, for uh, Yasmin Appa. I thought, sorry, I thought like you were saying I, I want to leave. So, <laughs> anyway, I, I read the wrong the hand signal. So, uh, yeah. anyway, so thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud Ashraf Sahib. So, I will definitely you. request uh, you also, and I will try to, uh, whatever role we can play, the association can play to pursue the AMU administration to have some kind of collaborative work uh, with Professor Yasmin Saikia and other uh, uh, faculty members, other academicians here to make a more yes. impactful publication either in the journals or the books. So we definitely will talk separately, Asmanapa, with you and with the association people so that we can work on that. I know people, a lot of people say alumni has to play a role and definitely we try our best to pursue the MU administration and academicians to, to the best of our abilities to, to collaborate. So that's what, that's what definitely the association will do with you, inshallah. Once again, thank you, everyone. I will request uh, uh, Mama Javis to please uh, say a word of thanks. Thank you, Abzal.
On behalf of Aligarh Alumni Association, Washington, D.C., I thank Dr. Yasmin Saiki on an insightful lecture on role of AMU alumni in the minority experience and the future. Thank you so much for sharing with us Arizona State University's efforts and contributions towards empowering Muslims in the United States. I thank Professor Muhammad Ashraf for gracing with us with his presence today and sharing with us the success story of Mathematics Department and AMU. I also thank the panelists for asking thought-provoking questions during the Q&A session. And lastly, I thank all the attendees for joining this lecture and making this a successful event. Thank you all. Thank you, Jayad Bhai. Before I start the Trana, let us let me make a simple announcement. I'm going to share my screen. As you all know, that Aligarh Alumni Associate, sorry, hold on. Let me bring this on. So, as you all know, that Aligarh Alumni Association has been doing a Mushara, even though uh, a lot of people don't like it, but it's a part of culture. Every community has a different requirement. So does the Washington DC metro area requirements are different than the, what is required here. So this year we are doing a little bit unique uh, way of doing Mushara. We are doing a hybrid mode where some of the poets will be joining uh, from different parts of the world, like Dr. Hilal Farid will be joining from UK, Fami Badayuni from Badayu, I'm a Salman Saab from somewhere else. So different, and there, there'll be some uh, some of the poets like Tariq Sabzawari, Yusuf Rahat, Fawzia Fatma, Ashok Narayan, and Abdurrahman Siddiqui, Sarwar Iqbal. They will be locally here in the Washington DC area. The program is on next Saturday uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Definitely India time is 9.30. We will broadcast on Zoom also and Facebook Live also. In U.S., it will be 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Pakistan, 9 p.m., India, 9.30, Dubai, 8 p.m., U.K., 4 p.m. And uh, physically, the event will be here at uh, 101 uh, Monroe Street, Rockville, Maryland, which is a Montgomery County Executive Office. So I will request uh, all the local people, those who are here, if they can make it, that will be great. So we have a limited seats and a light refreshment will also be provided to the, the people who join there. So I'll encourage everyone who can make it to that event live. They should come at the Montgomery County Executive Office, which is at 101 Monroe Street, Rockville. If you know, if you need any further information, please contact uh, Dr. Muhammad Akbar or me or Kamar Khan Saab or Sahib Khan Saab for, for more information. So once again, thank you. And let me play the MU Tarana and then we can conclude the program.
बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया इस शेर के साथ के रूह सर सैद से रोशन तेरा मैं खाना रहे रूह सर सैद से रोशन तेरा मैं खाना रहे रहती दुनिया तक तेरा गर्दिश में पैमाना रहे बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया खुदा हाफिज थैंक यू थैंक यू